Hi, I'm your host Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to one more week of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. And uh, this week, joining us from Atlanta in the US is Catherine Tankos. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you, Vasco. It's a pleasure being here. Absolutely. Great to have you here as well. So Catherine is a certified Scrum Master focused on agile transformations and helping teams build a better way of working. And uh, of course, I didn't know that, but I learned that by reading the bio, that Catherine is an Emmy Award winning news producer who became an avid agilist. And I'm, I'm sure we'll explore that throughout this week. And through communication, curiosity and collaboration, the pillars of successful agile teams. Those are the things that made her and of course helps her make her teams agile and inspire teams and organizational cultures to foster a sense of self-leadership throughout the transformation journey. Catherine, that was a, a short intro. Tell us a little bit more about your background and uh, how did you end up becoming a Scrum Master? My background is, as you can see from the intro, is pretty untraditional in the way I made my way into both technology and agile and eventually a Scrum Master. I was a journalist for NBC News and CNN combined for about 16 years. And while I was working at CNN, I had worked on an initiative to upgrade the way we produced live shots. And that's where you see the reporters on your TV doing their reports from the field. While I was on this project to upgrade the way we do these live shots and the technology behind it, the software development team at CNN got wind of my name and they reached out to me and asked me if I was willing to come on board as a product owner and subject matter expert to build out internal tools that the journalists in both the newsroom and out in the field would use to aggregate our stories and information and videos and things like that. When I worked in the newsroom, I would have anywhere up to 16 applications open just to do my job, which, as anybody knows, can slow down an old PC that get, never gets turned off. So these applications, the idea of these this tool set was to reduce the number of applications and, and have one-stop shopping, essentially, for uh, journalism tools that we need to do for our day-to-day -day jobs. So they looked at you and they said, hey, Catherine knows this thing inside out and we need to develop the software. So why not bring her on board? Yeah. So I don't even know how my name got to the technology group. I was working with technologists who were involved with hardware for broadcast TV. So you're talking cables and, you know, recording boxes and things like that. So I don't really know how my name got over to the technology group, to the software group. But yes, that's what happened. They said, hey, please come on board. We want to build these things. You know, the newsroom inside and out, you know, their pain points. How can we solve their problems? And that's how you got started with technology teams. Now, I don't know if that's how you got uh, introduced to the whole idea of Scrum or if you had heard about it before. But of course, because today is Fail Monday here on the podcast, we want to hear one of those stories where you as a Scrum Master, you did your best, but just like every one of us every day out there, uh, the best just wasn't good enough. So tell us that story, Catherine. This one is a bit of a doozy. Um, it's something I actually recently experienced. I was working on a team and it was a matrix team and we were located all throughout the globe. What do you mean by matrix, by the way? In the sense is that we were not a dedicated team. It was folks that were chosen from different parts of the organization to work on this specific project. And those teammates can be changed in and out or moved to other projects and things like that. So it's not a dedicated team that you might work with year after year after year. In this particular case, uh, we were located all over the globe. So we had constraints around time zone and things like that that made collaboration difficult to begin with. 
My understanding was that all team members were highly agile, had experience in agile, had experience in scrum. And as we started diving into the project, there started to be a lot of pushback about participating in any agile ceremony. So backlog refinement, planning sessions, and to sprint reviews. The team didn't feel that they needed to participate. Uh Uh-oh, that's a red flag. It is a red flag. They felt that the tech lead and the product owner could just run all those meetings without them. And they can, the developers can go on their merry way and just develop and all would be happy and well. Well, that's not what happened. (laughs) We all know that when that happens, usually things go wrong. Yes, it did. So what we started seeing is that we initially were trying to do a lot of the collaboration through, you know, messaging tools like Slack. The team was pretty adamant that all these in-person type meetings weren't necessarily needed and were more disruptive to them getting their work done. But what started happening is patterns started evolving that assumptions were being made that weren't aligned with the engineering design. Um, Can you give an example so that we kind of uh, picture what kind of assumptions were being made and where the conflict might arise? Initially, on this particular project, it was to modernize technology for a a particular product that was out there. And I can't say too much more because of NDAs, but it was to, to modernize the technology of a particular product. And we were in charge of doing um, the engineering design and the architecture design. And we started going ahead and working on the engineering and architecture designs kind of, you know, in a silo where we weren't necessarily reaching out and communicating with our partners, architects and folks who had a say and were the stakeholders in this product. And because of that, you know, technology was decided upon without checking in with the partners and saying, hey, is this the route that you were thinking? You know, is this aligned for what you want the product to do? Is this aligned for how you want it to scale? And it turned out that when we did these uh, formal review sessions, a lot of surprises came out where assumptions were made that the client uh, was like, oh, wait a minute, that's not what we had envisioned. So that was one situation that arose. Another one was, is that without really engaging in these formal and sprint reviews, we weren't capitalizing on getting the fast feedback where we could have caught things really far in advance. So you were doing reviews of what, like once a month or even longer? Yeah, about once a month, about once a month. Yeah. So that allows the engineering team to invest a whole four weeks into the wrong assumptions. Exactly, exactly. Uh, And it's hard to pivot after that because, you know, once you're set on the avenue that you want to take, it's it's hard to talk folks out of why they should not be going down that road. Um, And that is the set path at that moment in time. So it was, you know, a lot of, a bit of push and pull because it also impacts trust. Folks expect collaboration And when issues arise or questions arise that aren't being asked and that are solely being handled by the development team, it creates this environment of kind of opacity where you can't see through. There's no transparency. And of course, the surprises came up like at the end of the month. And uh, uh, once the surprises happen, that further impacts the perhaps already affected trust levels between stakeholders and team. How did that end up, though? So it was an ongoing issue for a very long time. And what kept coming out of retros, though, was that uh, the team felt that there was too many meetings. And this is a big failure on my part, because in deference to the team, I stepped back a little bit where I should have leaned in. So rather than adding more meetings to their schedule in terms of one-on-ones or smaller group meetings to get to the core of the issue and why they believed that collaboration wasn't necessary and in-person ceremonies weren't necessary, I instead thought, well, I want to respect their time for development and not distract them. So 
I try to work through these issues peripherally without adding more time on their calendar. And really what I should have done was added more time on the calendar. I should have really taken the time because collaboration was the issue. And here I didn't collaborate in the way that was needed to move this team forward. So I just thought that was pretty ironic. (laughs) Once all was said and done that I wasn't practicing what goal I was trying to reach, which was interesting to see. And I I think it kind of shows a little bit also how environments push people into certain behaviors. Like you said, I felt I needed to step back and not add more time to their calendar. But in fact, when you look back, you should have done the opposite, right? And and I I think that's something that, you know, for our listeners, that's a, a really important reflection trigger, if you will. Am I following what I think is needed, or am I following what the others are expressing should be followed? Correct. Because it's very easy to get caught up in the culture and follow it as it is, and then not really understand that actually, maybe this is now the time to start slowly changing the culture. That's correct. That's correct. I was allowing a lot of the feedback that was coming out of retro about the developers not having enough time to work or too many distractions. I was letting that feedback drive my own behavior in the sense that I didn't want to disturb them. And I was kind of being um, overly accommodating, I'd say, in a sense where we need to to tighten up as a group and, and work closely as a group. Absolutely. Well, that was a great story. Thank you for sharing that with us, Catherine. You're welcome. Monday is about what we learn from our obstacles and our failures. But tomorrow is Team Tuesday here on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. We explore teams and their journeys, the habits they develop that threaten their performance, how each of our guests help their teams evolve, and the one key lesson they learned from that experience. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring. 